And I'm really happy to introduce Brian Knudsen, who's Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Stanford University. He studies the way the brain works and how that translates into emotion, um, including, perhaps, suspense, uh, and is going to um, bring what's inside your and my heads now and when we're listening to stories uh, alive by talking about some of his research, right? I have to admit, at the outset, uh, when Martha asked me to speak today, I misunderstood her. And I thought she asked me to speak about the science of storytelling, when in fact she asked me to speak about the storytelling of science. Uh, however, uh, having listened to Davis and having seen uh, the last video clip, I do think that if we have a science of storytelling, it could, uh, in theory, inform how we tell the stories of our science and perhaps make us more effective storytellers. Uh, I'm not going to make any claims to be an effective storyteller at this point. Um, so, how many people felt something just then? Three, four, five, well maybe more, maybe 33 percent of you, right? So I'd like to argue that if I had you in my scanner, at that point in time, and I looked at what was going on in your brain, and many of you were actually feeling something at that moment uh, when we switched the black slide, and that I could actually see it in your brain, and that some of you may not even be aware of it, that you were feeling something at that moment. And I'd also like to argue that what you felt is important. It's important that we see that. It's important that we have the technology that will allow us to capture what is going on in your brain. In those few seconds, before the next thing happens, in those few seconds before you actually decide to do the next thing. I don't study the science of storytelling, but ultimately I hope that what we find in our science will lead to a science of storytelling. Uh, and I'm going to try to convince you of that today. Uh, and so just to contextualize what we are doing now uh, and where the field is right now, um, in the last 10 years, uh, new technologies like functional magnetic resonance imaging have allowed scientists to look uh, not only at cortical activity, but at activity deep below the cortex, at a second-to-second -second resolution, at a millimeter resolution. And this allows us to see for the first time, before uh, that technology was available, what is happening in living, breathing human brains as they're anticipating good and bad events, and even before they start to make a decision to do something. And this class of questions falls into sort of two broad categories which has occupied my lab and other labs over the last 10 years. One set of questions has to do with which brain mechanisms anticipate good and bad events. I, I call this affective neuroscience, you can call it whatever you want, uh, but many people are studying this now. Uh, this is a nascent field that's growing with every year. The second set of questions, which I think is even more interesting uh, from an application standpoint, is does the activity of those circuits actually influence choice? That is, we could capture this anticipatory activity in your brain. Can we use it then to predict very basic choices that you might make, like you might approach something or that you might avoid something? And keep in mind that the answer to, whoops, I'm losing my microphone here, sorry. Um, the answer to the first question is not necessarily the same as the answer to the second question. So many things might have happened in your brain when you were looking at that bank blank uh, screen. Only some of those things may actually influence then what you might do next, whether you walk out of the room or stay in your seat, for instance. So these are two very important but separate questions, potentially overlapping. And just to cut to the chase, so I'm going to cut through a lot of research, and you're going to have to just take it on faith that what I'm saying at least has some science be in, in behind it. Um, we now have targets using fMRI uh, for putting people in, in states of anticipation and trying to identify when they anticipate that something good might happen, something bad might happen, how they're integrating those signals. And the reason that's important is because it can then allow us to predict, are they more likely to approach something or to avoid something, based on the balance of those signals. Again, this is a new area of research, so there's much more that's going to be found out uh, in the next few years. And what that allows us to do then is, in many different situations, so these could include shopping, these could include uh, making financially risky choices, these even could include social choices, like will I trust this person or not? We can then use our brain activity to actually try to predict what people will do next. I'm gonna show you a really simple example uh, right now that we use in our lab. 
So for instance, here's a gamble. Imagine that I offered you this gamble on the screen. How many people, versus a, a sure chance of making nothing, how many people would take this gamble? No one would take it. Oh, good, thank you. Some risk takers in the audience too. Good, <laughs> excellent, okay, good. There is diversity in risk preferences. Um, how about this gamble right here? How many people would take this gamble? Good. You guys are consistent, that's good. Uh, we have a few more. We have maybe 20 to 10% uh, really of the people in the audience. How about this gamble? How many people would take this? Oh, I see more hands going up. I see almost 50% of the hands going up in this room. This is, this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. One is because I think it speaks to this paradox of suspense. Now, I don't know actually what Martha meant <laughs> by the paradox of suspense, but this is a paradox of suspense. And the paradox is this. If people are choosing according to the best option, the thing that they think will, the best, will be the best, why would they then systematically choose something that is not the best for them mathematically, okay? How can we calculate the expected value of these gambles? Well, it's pretty easy. You just take this amount, multiply it by the probability of that, and take this amount, multiply it by that probability, add it up, okay? So it turns out the expected value of all of these gambles uh, is actually not as you chose, it's equal. It's zero for each of these gambles. And yet in every audience I've spoken to <laughs> all around the world, People prefer this gamble. This is very attractive to them. Now you might say that's quirky, nice science project that you've done and go back to your lab. But I think what's interesting about this is that we can actually look at your brain as you are choosing whether to accept these gambles or not. Uh, and we can actually predict, not only that you're more likely to accept that gamble or not, but why people are inordinately drawn to this gamble, this positive skew gamble or this lottery gamble. It's because this area right here is systematically more excited in people by this gamble than the other gambles. What this also means from an applied standpoint is I can make money off of you, right? <laughs> because if you're willing to take that gamble, then I can charge you to take that gamble, right? And I can make that money because the expected value is zero. This is a paradox. This is violating expected value, okay? But people systematically show this. We can see things that are happening in the brain during anticipation. We can predict you're more likely to take that gamble. And because I like to look at brain images, here's just a, a uh, you can use big data techniques to classify the brain states that happen before people take that gamble and get a whole solution of everything. So this is not just a theoretically guided solution based on my preconceptions, but we can actually use sophisticated ways of looking at the data, data to get optimal predictions from your brain data. That's not why we're doing this. We actually are interested in what is going on during anticipation. What is the affective process? What is the emotional feeling that generates this kind of behavior? And the reason that we're interested in this is not just because we're interested in gambles. I don't work in Las Vegas, I work at Stanford. Um, but we're also interested in what draws people in, what engages people, what kinds of other decisions uh, powerfully activate and recruit the circuitry. We think social uh, types of decisions really engage the circuitry. And indeed, I think that it's probably effective storytelling engages these circuits. And, um, I'm making this a short presentation because of my lack of expertise. But I think actually just even based on this very minimal early data, I hope it will someday lead to sort of a science of storytelling. And, and I hope to use it in communicating to people. But I think even based on these early results, we can infer that if you want to engage people, obviously you should have a, a positive premise in there. Uh, I mean, it, this seems obvious to people and it's probably telling you something you already knew that there should be a positive gain outcome and that should be significant to people. But the counterintuitive part is that it should be uncertain. You shouldn't, so basically everything I was told in graduate school about how to deliver a science story is wrong. I was told to tell people, here's my hypothesis, right? here's what I found, and look, everything is consistent with my hypothesis. That's not right. I should see doubt in people. I should dynamically string them along with uncertainty if I really want to engage them. I don't know how to do that, I'm a scientist. I'm happy to learn. Uh, we have other people here who are experts at this, right? Um, but I think uh, scientists can definitely learn um, from the media and uh, from what is effective and what is not. And I hope there can be sort of a marriage of the science and the storytelling. So I think the implication for storytelling for me as a scientist is that you shouldn't state your conclusion first. You should actually cultivate a hopeful uncertainty no matter how improbable that is. In fact. It could be quite improbable, and you can engage people. 
and maybe you will uh, your message will stick longer and motivate action more effectively. Thanks.